Okay. Um, sorry, I think the Paul Brady. Uh, this is Larry Izzo with Queen Harbors. Paul Brady was going to hop on in just a second. Um, he might have punched in the wrong dial-up number. Um, I just sent resent it over to him. So, uh, just mind maybe waiting a second or two. No worries. That's perfectly okay. Hello, this is Paul from Clean Harbors. Come on. Hey, Paul, it's Larry. Um, we basically have the uh, presentation queued up, so um, if you want to start, um, go right ahead. Larry, you can run with it. Okay. I uh, just want to thank everyone for coming out for this. Uh, I want to make sure we can see my presentation on the blue jean screen. Uh, can we see that all right, Drew? Yes, sir. We can see that. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Izzo. I work with uh, Clean Harbors, um, Project uh, Remediation Manager. I'm also in charge of kind of our mobile uh, thermal operations within the remediation group. I have uh, Paul Brady on with me. He's a senior vice president of our uh, national remediation group within Queen Harbors. And today we're just going to go over a quick presentation of our mobile thermal cremation unit. Um, get started. This is the uh, Hurricane 1000E unit, pictured there below. It's a trailer mounted unit. Um, we purchased these in 2015. Um, these are designed specifically for um, instant or uh, for cremation of animal carcasses. Um, right here is kind of a layout. Um, as you can see, it, it's pretty much all set up on the trailer there. The only thing uh, once we uh, mobilize to a site is just setting up the stack really uh, there's maybe one or two smaller trailers of support equipment that we bring along with it, but everything's pretty much self-contained within the trailer. Go to the next slide. Um, what this treatment is, it's a two-stage operation. There's basically two treatment compartments that are um, comprised in that. Um, the first one is uh, the solid combustion compartment. That's where we load uh, any material, carcasses, whatever we're trying to treat gets loaded into the first compartment. Um, temperatures run up to about 1400 to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. And the second compartment is where the gas is treated from the first compartment. Now, the temperatures run about 1900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there are I believe four um, primary burners that are located in the first compartment, and then there's three burners that are located in the secondary compartment. Um, part of our, our technology that, that we like to, you know, emphasize with this is the off gas from this treatment. Um, I'll show in a different slide. Uh, there's a two-second retention time of the gas coming out of that first chamber into the second chamber. And that's really where we achieve a lot of our reduction in emissions. Um, we have a self-powered containment lid that you'll see in the video that helps seal the top lid of the treatment uh, of the uh, treatment compartment. And as I stated before, there's a parts and trailer uh, or parts and repair trailer that comes along with the unit uh, in case anything needs to be fixed up during operations. I think it's also important to note that the units are totally portable. We can drop these really in the middle of of rural America. We don't we don't need to be around a power source. We don't need to be around a fuel station. Um, they can run for for three days uh, self sufficiently. They run on power generators and the fuel tanks. 
so they're they're pretty portable units. They don't they don't need to be housed anywhere spe uh, specific to operate. Right. Thanks, Paul. Um, what I pulled up on the screen here is just some some background engineering. Um, this is what we usually provide to different uh, air quality divisions when we do operate these that show the two second retention time. Um, you know, some of these units we we had to convert over these these products were actually manufactured over in the United Kingdom, so that's why you have both metric and uh, American units there. Um, I'll obviously include this uh, as part of the presentation to share after this for, for anybody that wants me to email it out. So typically we run uh, these units in a 24 hour operation. It's a three person crew of uh, personnel that we have trained specifically on this unit. Um, the main compartment can be loaded with uh, standard yellow iron equipment, loader, backhoe, et cetera. Um, we can do this in bulk from stockpiling. We can do this from containers such as roll-off bins or uh, if, if it is within smaller containers like small drums, we can load in certain types of drums as long as uh, they're not self-contained, as long as they don't have the lids on it. Um, everything operated on this unit is uh, one point of control as a touchscreen HMI interface. Um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty self-reliant uh, piece of machine that, that's just very simple to train on, very simple to operate, and uh, very efficient. Uh, the primary compartment can take about five to six tons of material depending on what you're treating in the primary compartment. Um, the overall volume it can take is a close to about 20 cubic yards. So if you if you consider maybe a large roll-off container, that's what we can we can fit in that primary compartment. Um, treatment is shown to uh, be able to run probably about two to three tons per hour of material to get maximum destruction out of it. Um, this unit runs off of uh, diesel fuel, can be retrofitted run off of different kinds of fuels such as propane or uh, natural gas. Um, we have it just as a diesel fuel. It makes it uh, a little bit easier as far as keeping it portable and just, uh, just ease of operation. And the destruction rate on our material is typically between 90 and 95% once everything is treated. And that's, that's what's remaining in the ash after full treatment. Um, the ash is collected in the bottom of the primary compartment. There's uh, six individual chambers that can be removed. Uh, one nice feature is with all the high heat and everything, these, this system is actually designed where the chambers can be changed out during operation and uh, won't, won't be any harm to anybody who is doing that work. Um, after the secondary compartment, all the exhaust is funneled out of the stack that sits at 26 feet above ground surface and it's about a one and a half foot diameter stack. Um, some of these emissions I include on this slide, these are emissions are really vary depending on the material and, and where we're burning everything. These were actually some tests uh, provided by our vendor from from different operations around the world, some from the Middle East, some from Asia, uh, poultry farms, other various types of uh, agricultural use on this. So it just kind of gives you an idea of what they've seen this before, but like I said, really our emissions, it's gonna vary depending on, on the type of operation and what we're processing. So I'm just gonna run a little quick video, give the, the overview we just discussed. Here. I apologize for no audio on this video. We we had a little issue trying to get that rolling yesterday. But this was filmed at a site, I believe in was it Georgia last year, Paul, that we had run this operation? 
Yes, this is at a Georgia poultry farm and the, um, the air permitting division from the state of Florida, Tennessee, and South Carolina attended this. Actually, as did the University of Georgia and the USDA. So there it is. This was, uh, we had bulk material that we were loading with a front end loader. The key to this video too is that that incineration unit, the crematorium right now, is actually running. That's that's burning. So you can see that it's it's got really good handle on uh, exhaust, smoke, um, particle discharge. So it's it's really a pretty tight, efficient unit. And that, that picture there is the unit running at about 1,500 degrees, burning poultry as we speak. And you can see the stack is, is relatively clean. It, It'll look like steam. You'll get pockets of steam that'll come out of it from time to time. That was our best attempt to get a, a clean shot at the stack as it was burning. That's the control panel. Those are the six cleanouts. We can open those as the unit's running. Um, it's certainly warm on that side, but the insulation inside the unit is pretty tight. And that's the ash after you're done processing what it was that you were processing. And I'd certainly like to tell you that it's more complicated than that, but it's not. And that's uh, that's pretty much it for our presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything they want to follow up on, feel free to speak up. All right, does anyone have any questions for uh, Paul or Larry? Did we lose them? No, um, everyone, if you've got questions, remember that uh, most lines are muted. Um, so click to unmute your, your, uh, your line. Um, but any questions, go ahead and speak up. So, Paul and Larry, I have a quick question. You said uh, that it reduces the material to 90, 95 percent. That, in other words, the the mass, the volume is reduced by 95 percent or so. That's correct. It it okay. it's a, functions like a crematorium. It's no different than than processing anything else through an incineration phase type unit. It, it takes mass and reduces it down to ash. And what we've found is on poultry um, and a few other uh, farm-like um, carcasses, it, it's down to about 90 to 95%. So we can reduce pretty good volumes of material and, and give you smaller amounts to to landfill. Excellent. Thank you. Hey guys. I'll ask a question. Order. 
I was wondering, uh, will this handle anything other than poultry? In other words, like um, small ruminants, uh, hogs, something like that? Yes, it, it'll process any carcass. Um, the units have been used for mad cow disease in the UK. It's been used in Saudi Arabia for uh, camel carcasses. It was used in China for um, hogs, pigs, and poultry. Uh, in the U.S., we've used it for chickens, turkeys, um, raccoons, and possums. Um, so it's got a pretty wide range. What will vary is the, the burn time. So uh, chickens and, and pheasant have hollow bones, so obviously they process faster. Um, it, it just really comes down to processing time. But what we found is we'd also can burn whole carcasses. We're not we're not forced with with cutting up carcasses and and kind of butchering things on site. That gets messy. That gets a little bit dangerous. That gets a little bit hazardous. The unit will process whole carcasses, and depending on what you're processing, it just impacts burn time. That's all. Yeah, I'd like some more information if you've got you know papers or some pictures or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think we can. We could. I, let me see what we have in the archive for what it's processed in the past, and we'll forward that off. Thank you. So, um, speaking of, of you know processing larger animals, um, based on the size of the opening, how many? Like, if you're talking cows or or other large animals, how many can you get in there? How many carcasses at once? It's based on weight. So you, you don't want to put more than than five or six tons in to begin with because it, okay. it functions as it builds heat within the chamber. So you, you'll start it with five or six tons, give or take, and then every hour on the hour, you're, you're probably loading in two to three tons, and it, it keeps a pretty good pace at that. Again, it will vary a little bit depending on what you're burning, but it's it's pretty consistent. Good deal. Thank you, sir. Barb, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask a little more about emissions. Um, uh, a lot of times when we're doing incineration, you know, it's it's the local community that gets on our tails about smoke and odors and that kind of thing. Uh, if you can, they can maybe talk a little bit more about um, uh, you know, what exactly comes out and what it does with odors and that kind of thing. We've not had any issues with odors. It does not, um, it does not release black smoke uh, or anything like that. You wouldn't know from the sound that it's even on. Uh, when the state of Florida's air permitting group, I think is the gentleman's name was Dave Reed, showed up, uh, we were burning for a few hours. He didn't even know the unit was on. Uh, every now and then you'll get some white steamish smoke that comes out of the stack. Uh, from an emission standpoint, we were in an uncontaminated chicken poultry farm. Um, we were doing a presentation for them. Uh, we, we just said, you, you don't smell anything other than the chickens, to be honest with you. It's, it's a pretty clean operation. When we mob it to sites, we take that opportunity to do additional stack testing uh, from time to time on it to, to stay maintained with the unit. But we've run it in in pretty rural areas all over the place, and we've, we've not had any complaints. Uh, typically what we do is we go into to wherever it is that it's being asked. We meet with the local fire department. We walk them through the unit so they understand it. We typically get a fire permit because it's a diesel-fired unit and it is a crematorium. Fire departments on board. We've we've run it probably four or five times, and we've we've not had a problem. And it's this unit actually scheduled to run in Iowa uh, starting mid November. And I think it's Larry. Is it sheep or or lamb? I forget what we're doing. I believe we're doing 
sheep carcasses in, in Ames, Iowa, mid-November, and right outside of Ames, Iowa. So it, it's a pretty clean operation. I, it's hard to judge by the video, but if you were standing in front of it, you'd, you'd struggle to know that it was on unless you were standing right next to it and you felt the heat. All right, any other questions for uh, Paul or Larry? Okay, hearing none. Um, Paul, Larry, thank you all very much for the information. That was uh, really appreciated and um, looks, uh, looks like a, a very useful unit. Um, Actually, and I, I guess I guess is it something that you guys would would care to see in operation? Is it something that you would want to see a pilot test done? Because we've we've done that in the past. I don't know if that's beneficial. It's hard to to do it justice in a presentation. It it really it really is a unit that that sells itself once you see it operate. But if it's a pilot test that that would help you guys, we can certainly try to arrange that or at least let you know where it's going to be operating. And if, if there's availability, you can certainly visit the unit. Um, I would, uh, you know, I'll certainly defer to everyone else on the call for that. But uh, I suppose if, um, you know, if, they're, if anyone's interested in the pilot test or seeing when it's in operation, uh, you can get in touch with uh, Andy or, or Laurie or, or let me know, and I'll pass that information on. Okay. Um, I do have one other quick question. Um, when you load the, the material in the, the first part, um, is it burned right, is it incinerated right there in that chamber, or is it moved further on first? No, that's it. That front okay. chamber with the sliding door, uh, the sliding roof, that's the burn chamber. Inside that chamber, there's a grate system that the carcasses rest on when you dump them in, and there's a five burner system in there. And then the exhaust chamber is the second chamber where all the exhaust comes through and then goes out the stack. Okay, great. Nothing, Thank you, sir. goes into that second stack, just an exhaust chamber. Everything stays in the primary chamber. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Hi, Drew. This is Andy. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I was challenged by my phone earlier, so now I'm using the computer. But at any rate, I wanted to ask Larry and, and Paul, um, are there any plans for fielding smaller units than this? Because um, I know, at least in Florida, that was one of the objections that was raised early on without the um, without the folks there really having any any real knowledge of of the capabilities and so forth, they were just concerned about the footprint, the size of the of the unit itself. We do have a Hurricane 500, which is the size of a single chamber. Um, it's it's basically the same technology and the same process. Um, we, I personally don't see it as efficient. It's a little bit more difficult on the exhaust side. Um, it doesn't have the same retention time. Depending on what it is that you are trying to cremate, typically infected um, carcasses, we have, to, we have to base the retention times by CDC. So H1N1 and, and a few others that we were dealing with required a 1.2 and a 1.4 second retention time. A lot of the air permitting requirements in certain states for crematoriums require certain retention times on the exhaust. So the, the smaller units don't always give you that retention time. So we struggle a little bit with that. But we, we do have a smaller unit. It's, it's a, in essence, the same technology. Um, I would challenge that it's just not as efficient as the 1000 is. 
Okay, thanks. And then um, earlier you were you were talking about uh, demonstrations. Do you have anything planned with the uh, with Lisa Brown of the NBS? I believe she will be involved at some level with the Ames Iowa firm that's going to take place in a few weeks. I don't know if she'll actually be there. I know that she was in the loop on that process. Uh, the USDA was involved through that process. Uh, Larry's been spearheading that one. So, I, I, Larry, I don't know if you know for sure if, if Lisa will be there, but uh, I, I do know she was involved early. I, I don't know if she plans on participating yet. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Any other questions for Paul or Larry? All well, right, we certainly Paul. appreciate the opportunity, everybody. Hopefully that unit met your uh, your expectations. And if there's anything else we can get you, please let us know. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, anything else for the uh, good of the group today? Any other uh, topics for discussion that anyone wants to bring up? Hi, Drew, this is Andy again. Um, I suppose it might be worthwhile if anyone has an opinion about when we should look at the fire truck uh, foam depop. Um, I got word back from South Dakota and they're on board, but uh, I don't know exactly when we would want them to uh, present that. Perhaps sometime in November. Any um, any preferences from anyone on the call? Okay, that's all right. Maybe we can revisit right. it at our next meeting. And Andy, I'll get with you offline because I've got um, I Laurie was uh, trying to um, work one out as well for um, an upcoming an upcoming meeting, and I've got. The person who she was trying to work it out with, I've got some openings in her schedule when she can't present, so that uh, maybe we can coordinate around that. So. Okay, sounds good. Yep, we can talk after. Hi. Right. Anything else for the good of the group today? All right, hearing none, we will talk... Um, Tentatively, uh, if we can, we'll talk next uh, next Wednesday, same time. And uh, if we have a presentation, I will send out information and let you all know. Otherwise, we'll be on the uh, regular call-in line. Thank you all very much. Hey, Drew, next week you don't have a call. All right. It's the first thank Wednesday you. of the month. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I forgot that we had... Uh, Thank you for reminding me about that. That's right. We don't have a call next week. So two weeks from today. Thanks so much, Brian. I totally forgot. No worries. All right. Thank you all very much.